Hello, everyone. Welcome to this morning's uh, plenary session. Um, thank you, everyone, for, for coming today. Um, I know that we've sort of had quite unusual circumstances um, the last few weeks, so it's great to see that so many people can still be here. Uh, my name is Gemma Taylor. I'm uh, from the University of Bath in the United Kingdom. Um, and it's an absolute honor and pleasure to be here today to introduce Professor Paul Aveyard for our clinical keynote plenary session. I've known Paul for about 10 years now. Um, Paul was my PhD supervisor at the University of Birmingham in the UK. And there are a number of us here today who were supervised by Paul. Um, so it feels like a little family reunion. Um, and Paul has generously invested in all of us um, over the years since our PhDs, and we're all very grateful for his continued support. Uh, Paul is a clinical academic, and he works part-time as a general practitioner or a family doctor. Um, and he's also a professor of behavioral medicine at the University of Oxford. Uh, and very impressively, Paul is also the coordinating editor of the Cochrane Tobacco Addiction Group. Paul trained in medicine and specialized in general practice at the University of London, and then he completed his PhD at the University of Birmingham uh, on the topic of smoking cessation in schools. He very quickly moved up the ranks uh, to professor shortly after his PhD. Uh, you might be familiar with some of Paul's work. He's produced some landmark papers over the years, including his work on brief interventions in primary care, nicotine preloading, and smoking reduction interventions. I've been incredibly privileged to learn from Paul over the years. He's usually the smartest guy in the room. And I'm sure that you'll all learn a lot from Paul's talk today on the challenge of implementing smoking cessation treatment. So uh, without further ado, my academic dad, Paul. So I'm going to start my timer. There we go. So uh, you know you're going to get out on time. So um, I want to try and deal with the conundrum that we face as a community. We've got an awful lot of people who want to stop smoking. Say, you know, in developed countries, the large majority of people who smoke say they want to stop. Indeed, many of them try to stop every year. Um, and yet, we fail, or they do not use the best available treatments to help them stop smoking to help them succeed. And if they did, we'd have far fewer smokers in our countries. And so that's the conundrum. And the other side of the conundrum, of course, is, is the role of doctors and uh, clinicians. There are lots of ways that we can drive treatment towards people, but perhaps one of the sort of most salient and easiest ways ought to be through uh, involving clinicians in giving treatment. After all, that's sort of what clinicians are meant to do. Uh, and yet they don't. And so that's the conundrum I want to try and address today. Um, obviously, I'm talking about uh, treatments of various kinds, including behavioral support. Um, I have no uh, connections with the pharmaceutical companies. Right. Now, um, I'm just going to give you a very brief bit of background from my country. This is England, and this is ever smoking amongst young people with a whole load of policy initiatives on that graph. And you can see that it's coming down nicely. We are doing well at preventing ever smoking in young people. This is what we call regular smoking. Uh, in other words, weekly, at least weekly smoking. And again, you see it coming down uh, to quite low levels now, uh, although it obviously varies by age, with 15-year-olds being about 10 or 11 percent smoking prevalence in our latest data. So we are doing well with young people. This is what you might call the sort of peak smoking prevalence group. Um, and you can see that over the last 12 or so years, it's halved in prevalence for peak, what you might call peak smoking prevalence in, in young adults. And uh, here we're looking, ah, press harder. Uh, here we're looking at different uh, age groups. And the younger people are in the blue stripes there. And the prevalence is going down more rapidly in those younger people than it is in older people. And this emphasizes, once again, I think, the need to think about ways in which we help these older, presumably more addicted, smokers to stop, 
because it's in them that they will experience the uh, mortality and mor morbidity that comes from smoking. Uh, Anne showed this picture yesterday. Uh, it's, uh, it's the use of smoking cessation aids in England. Uh, and England is a, a country, as Anne said, that has free smoking cessation treatment. And the two least popular aids to cessation, um, the, the, the most popular aid, as it were, is nothing at all, but the least popular is the best treatments available, going to a stop smoking clinic and using prescribed medication. So that's the issue that we're facing here. So how can we scale up this treatment? How do we get more treatments for people more often? Um, as Gemma said, I work with the Cochrane Tobacco Addiction Group, and here we all are looking tremendously relaxed in front of that camera. And um, we are now over 20 years old as a group, not we weren't all in it 20 years ago, but uh, 20 years old as a group. Uh, and in 2016, when we were 20, we did a prioritization exercise asking what are the priorities for tobacco control research. We followed a process called the James Lind Alliance process, but that involved clinicians and people who smoke, not exactly patients in this context, but people who smoke, but it also included charities, policy makers, other sorts of professionals, researchers even, in deciding on priorities across tobacco control, including for us as a group. And we came up with this list. Uh, you don't need to read it now, except to say that this one, treatment delivery, came in at number two as the second, what we thought was the most important, behind health inequalities. OK. so. Uh, Interventions by clinicians start with what I'm going to call GPs. Um, that's what we call family physicians in the UK, brief advice. I'm just going to go back a second. Now, in the UK, um, you'd think that we ought to be able to get this right. We have, uh, we have a, a, f a health service that is free at the point of delivery. Anyone can go see a GP. Uh, and uh, on average, about eight or nine out of 10 people do so every year. They go on average about five times a year to see their doctor, and the doctors are actually paid money in order to do brief interventions. Not only that, our medication for stopping smoking is available free or at a very low price, relatively speaking, and we have a national smoking cessation service. So we ought to be able to get this job done and yet, over the time, around about five in 10 people report that their doctor talked to them about smoking at all, and about two in 10 say, my doctor gave me help to stop or offered help to stop per year. So we're clearly failing in some way or other. Now, that suggests there's some kind of roadblock in the way. And I made this slide a few years ago now when I sort of believed in this thing called the barriers. And the assum assumption here, I suppose, is if that we, I suppose if we trained doctors to do this quickly, if we told them that it worked, and it does, if we taught them how to do it, because doctors in Britain, I guess, and, and many other countries leave medical school not knowing how to do it, and if we showed them the evidence that patients actually would welcome support to stop smoking, then these barriers would come tumbling down and doctors would do this. But I don't really believe that's true anymore. And I want to try and tell you why I think that is. This is a study. It's not about smoking cessation as such. It's about cardiovascular disease prevention. And there's something called the National Service Frameworks from a while ago in Britain. It's an initiative that was designed to uh, structure um, support to help people reduce their risk of cardiovascular disease. And it was. Amongst other things, the, in, the researchers did interviews, and they, they did something like this. So let me just summarize the interview to date, please. Um, what, what, what you've told me is that cardiovascular disease is a very important uh, issue for your patients, and that much more could be done for prevention. So can, can you tell me now why you're not engaging with these national service frameworks? And while I may have exaggerated slightly to make a point, it's the kind of research that we do in our field where essentially we send out earnest people like us who really believe in this stuff and then ask doctors why they're not doing it. 
It turns out that in such circumstances, doctors don't always say what they truly think or feel. Now, this is what the doctors said in this study. This is one practice. There were five different practices. And, and all through these practices, you've got this kind of stuff going on. But what these researchers did was they kind of hung out in these practices and saw what was going on and understood in different sorts of ways what the issues were. And the doctors, um, what actually happened in this particular practice was that the doctors were under a lot of pressure. Someone had left the practice, and they just thought, oh, I'm up to here with it all. I cannot, cannot take on anything more. But unbeknownst to the doctors, one nurse thought, this is a jolly good idea. It's really going to help our patients. And she got on and implemented this national service framework. As a result, the doctors said, oh, fantastic. Let's call her Sarah. Fantastic work, Sarah. Let's get on and do this. So all of this stuff about is not appropriate for our patients, that just all dropped away. That was stuff that doctors say to make it seem like a responsible action rather than anything else. So we've got to dig behind and stop doing the kinds of studies that I, I suggested we uh, are misleading us. Um, what they say is, uh, and this is beginning to get at where the nub of the problem lies, is that this is something about the identity of being a doctor and what it means to be a doctor and the degree to which all of that stuff, that national service framework, fits in with what it is that I think I do. Here's one study that sort of does begin to get a little bit at some of the nub of the problem here. The doctor is saying, it's boring, it's boring to do uh, health promotion type work. And I didn't go to medical school for that. And so it, that brings us on to the issue of prestige and prestige in medicine. If I say I'm a cardiologist, you probably go, ooh. If I say I'm a psychogeriatrician, you go, ah. Uh. <laughs> you know that is true. But prestige also applies to the kinds of conditions that doctors treat or like to treat. Um, I hope that for all of you, you remain healthy and then uh, die age 93 in bed and uh, all is well. But if you are going to get a disease, um, I'm going to show you data from a study where doctors are sort of talking about a, a, a hierarchy of diseases and prestige in diseases, and they're sort of justifying it. They didn't make this hierarchy. This was, came from previous research. But they all endorsed it. So if you are going to get a disease, try to make it one of these ones, because your doctor will like it if you do. It will put, spend a lot of attention on you. These ones are OK, right? But try not to get any of these ones, because your doctor will not be that interested. Now. Um, I went to medical school when I was 18. I, uh, at 17, I was interviewed. And what I said in that interview when they said, well, why do you want to be a doctor? I said, I want to help people. And I didn't just say that. That's actually really what I felt. And uh, now there's a whole industry that tells you how to get into medical school. And the first thing they say is, don't say that. But that's what I said. <laughs> and uh, my son is a medical student now, actually. He's in the fourth year of his medical training out of six. And in the third year in his medical school, they kind of step out of uh, medical training and do a year of science. And I make that distinction quite advisedly. And his science, he did psychology, or as they call it in his medical school, psych holiday. And so it begins this system of disparaging certain types of knowledge, certain types of behaving. These two books are pretty, uh, I don't know whether any of you know them. The one on the, well, the Adam K book is a British book that was at the top of the bestsellers chart. And uh, he's actually now left medicine, but he describes all the way through his book the way that he perceives his job as about life saving, saving lives. That's what he thinks he's doing. Um, now, there's a specialty in medicine. In the US, you call it otorhinolaryngology. Uh, in Britain, we're a bit more prosaic. We call it ear, nose, and throat. <laughs> and uh, it's usually abbreviated to ENT, uh, or as Adam Kay styles it, early nights and tennis. And that's a term of disparagement, because Adam knows 
that the joys of going home early and playing tennis are less than the sense of value he gets from staying in the hospital for all, at all hours, saving lives. And I don't need to explain that to you because you're all academics and you know exactly the same thing. You know that your science is important. You know that publishing in high prestige journals is important. You have, or we have, as I count myself as a scientist too, we have our system of hierarchy and prestige all about academic kudos. And we doctors have our different system, which is all about which treatments we, which patients we like to help and which ones we don't want to help. And it's as though we go to medical school wanting to help everybody with our little bleeding hearts. And we emerge from medical school saying, I want to help everybody who is worthy of my help. And um, that is sort of the truth about uh, medicine. Right, what is it that makes a condition worthy of treatment? Here's a model, the top three are from that model and the fourth I've added. Um, I'm gonna present this the way that a doctor might think about it. So, a person chooses to smoke uh, even though they know it's really dangerous. A person who smokes lives a normal life for years and years and years, and nothing bad happens to them. They go about their normal life. They may tell you they want to stop smoking, but the next time you see them, you see them cadging a cigarette with their mates outside a pub, laughing and joking. And when you try to help people stop smoking, it doesn't work. As a result of which, this, well, let's call it disorder, is a low status disorder, and thereby hangs the problem for us about moving this into the domain of medical treatment. Now, I, um, we published a systematic review, as Gemma said, about smoking reduction, showing that people who didn't really want to stop smoking, um, if you gave them nicotine replacement treatment, they, um, they, they, they doubled the rate of cessation, and, and it was published in a, in a big medical journal. And an American physician wrote in and said, nah, look at that, it, hardly anyone stops, it's just not worth it. So I wrote a response in which I pointed out, what, if you know, the number needed to treat. I looked at various common medical treatments and said, uh, look, here are things that you think are valuable, and the number needed to treat in order to get someone to stop is less than the number needed to treat for these other medical students, uh, medical treatments. So, ha! I didn't add that last bit. <laughs> but that's what I felt. And a colleague wrote to me and said, Paul, you're missing the point here. You're missing the point. And this is what he taught me. So this is sort of like the number needed to treat. These are various common medical treatments. The smoking ones are here. Uh, there are some general practice -y ones, and that's treating cancer at the right hand end. And what you can see there is these are the people who, because you treat 100 people, will get better because of that treatment. Smoking looks the same as everything else. But what doctors actually experience is this. The dark green ones are the ones who get better in spite of treatment. Not because of it, but in spite of it. And the red ones are the ones who don't. So for most common treatments, the experience of a doctor is that your patients will come back and say, thanks very much, doctor, that really worked. Whether it worked or not, we, we don't know. But if you look at it as a scientist, you say, well, it, it's the same. But as a doctor, it feels different. So that's the background into which we come as a community asking our, our doctors to improve delivery of smoking cessation treatment. So let's have a look now at a few of the things that we've tried and see how they're stacking up. So first off, here's the evidence that brief opportunistic interventions by GPs works. Very solid evidence. Here's a US guidance as it happens, but I could go to any country pretty much and look and see this same thing. A grade, top quality evidence that this works. Clinicians ought to be doing that. And that's what guidelines say all around the world. And um, this is what's called the cost effectiveness plane. I'm not going to explain it to you if you don't know what it is. It doesn't really matter. But it turns out that doing brief opportunistic interventions is in this quadrant of the plane. In other words, they are less, 
the, okay, you spend some money, a physician time effectively up front, but you get back more money, you save money for the health service. So that any rational doctor would spend his or her time doing all of this stuff, doing brief interventions till he could do or she could do no more. That would be the rational thing to do. It would also be an appeal to the kind of person I was when I was 17 years old and going to medical school where I just wanted to help everybody. But I want to say to you that doctors are neither rational nor caring. <laughs> At least we are not boundlessly so. We operate within the sphere of what is seen as good medicine. And so we mostly do stuff up here, which is what you might call more established medical treatments that cost money, but do some good. Okay. Um, we have tried as a community to train our clinicians on the barriers basis. And of course, this is modestly successful. It does increase abstinence in the uh, medium to longer term. So some, certainly worth doing, but not that successful. We also, as I said, in the UK, we pay our clinicians to do this. And let me tell you about a study we did a few years ago now, um, where we changed, or we worked with the Department of Health to change the QOF system, this payment for performance that GPs go, uh, have. Let me try and simplify that for you. So prior to 2012, the offer was, what the ask of GPs was to offer advice, unstated what that was, or referral. But after 2012, it was to offer support and treatment, meaning behavioral support and medication. And previously, it went from about 15% of the population, people with smoking-related disease only, to everybody who smokes. So that was what happened. So, uh, you know, the numbers who should have come into this system were, should be much greater. But what actually happened was this. This is data from millions of GP consultations that we analyzed. And you can see that there was an increase indeed in advice to quit. There was an increase in referrals and no change in medication prescription. So, but the changes that did occur were modest in scale, given that now four or five times as many people came under the remit of brief advice. So even paying GPs has modest effects. So far, I may have painted a picture of clinicians that is not as sympathetic as um, you may feel that it should be. We're not always the best people, but I want to invite, I'd ask you now to sort of walk a mile in our shoes and see how it feels, or sit in our chair, and see how it feels to do a consultation and see what you feel afterwards about us try, not resisting, as it were, this uh, ask to do these brief interventions. I'm gonna play you a video which uh, is exemplifies the British approach to doing a brief intervention, which is called the three A's approach. You'll see them pop up on the screen and so you'll know what they are. Let's go, please. Here's your prescription for the antibiotics. What would you like to know? Uh, before you go, do you smoke? Yeah, about 10 a day. I know it's not very good for me. Well, did you know that with the right support and treatment, you can make it much easier to stop and stay stopped? Oh, you mean patches and stuff. I've tried them and the gum, but they don't really help me, to be honest. Well, there's all sorts of treatments. And getting support from someone trained in helping people stop smoking can make a big difference, too. Would you be interested in that? If you think it would help. Yeah, it really would. All you have to do is call this number, the local Stop Smoking Service, and they'll put you in touch with someone who can arrange treatment and support you while you try and quit. Okay, I might just do that. Thank you very much for your help. No problem at all. Best of luck. I don't know whether you've worked it out, but those people were actors. <laughs> because we doctors just aren't that smooth. <laughs> and neither do patients behave like that nice smiley lady. So let's leave La La Land and move back into some real consultations. Now we analyzed over 500 GP consultations. These were consultations that were just recorded. There were nothing to do with smoking studies at all. They were just re recordings of consultations. Over 500. Uh, roughly speaking, therefore, we can imagine that there was about 100 people smoking 
in the, who came to see a doctor who were recorded, and in 31 cases, smoking was raised, so about a third. Most of the time, patients, um, well, about a fifth of the time, patients raised the issue of smoking. Interestingly enough, even when patients had admitted that they were smoking, the doctor still comes back with, so are you smoking, as a question, which is showing you the way in which we um, are, have these ingrained habits of consultation. Now, what we did was try to put these, that 3A framework on this, and it didn't really fit. But overall, this is a kind of scorecard. We reckon that about one person out of that 100 smokers went away from the consultation with some intention to go to a stop smoking service. So one in 100, and the rest had various other things. So what we've done instead is to use a thing called conversation analysis to uh, understand what's going on in consultations and why it's proving so difficult for doctors to do this work effectively. Um, and uh, you can see here some of the transcript. Now, you see lots of funny marks, and those funny marks are telling you it's the sort of written equivalent of how speech sounds. It's telling you what speech is, how it's sounding, where the emphasis are, where the emotionality is, and as a result of which, um, you can then, you, effectively, it's like listening to the speech, but you, you get some sort of thing, uh, uh, some detail about what's going on. This, you need to note those, those are um, seconds of pause, so 0.3 seconds of pause there. Okay. So here, this is a consultation, as you can see, about a cough in those halcyon far-off days, pre-COVID, when the doctor is still in the room. <laughs> and this is the key thing. So, are you a smoker? First of all, the thing to note is this is taking place in the history section of the consultation. You know Dr. Dr. Smooth there, who did the video? Dr. Smooth did it right at the end, right? But for the most part, People are asking about smoking right, in the beginning of the, uh, right near the beginning of a consultation because it's epidemiologically re relevant to the conditions that the person may have. And the doctor says, oh, so are you a smoker? And the person goes, yeah. Right? Not. Yeah, about 10 a day. <laughs> Here's another one. I'm going to act this one out. I'll see how you, you feel about it. Do you smoke? Sometimes. Sometimes. Awkward, isn't it? <laughs> so the doctor breaks the silence and says, well, how often is sometimes? Oh, not that much. And it, so it goes on. And you see this game of cat and mouse. As soon as the doctor starts to ask about smoking, we've got this little chase going on in a consultation. What we are seeing is we're seeing that asking about smoking causes people to feel guilty. It causes, well, I'm assuming, because we don't know this, but we, we, we can make a reasonable inference it's causing guilt, it's causing negative emotions, and it's effectively showing resistance. Doc, uh, patients are all the time resisting the notion that there is some sort of troublesome smoker. And that's how we start our brief interventions, which doesn't feel like a great place to be starting. So, at this point, I want to take a parenthetical pause and talk about motivational interviewing, because when I say I do, oh, brief interventions and consultations, people say to me, oh, so you do motivational interviewing then? And um, I, the, people love motivational interviewing, and they love it because of this. These are the principles. What's not to love about that? It's like the <laughs> counseling equivalent of a good hug pre-COVID. <laughs> But the question is, does it really work? Does it help people stop smoking? And we published this review at the end of last year and where we compared people who got or interventions where people got motivational interviewing to those where they didn't, and we divided them into several groups. Here we're looking at motivational interviewing versus nothing, no evidence of an effect. MI plus other treatment versus other treatment, no evidence of an effect. Uh, versus uh, other interventions, again, no real evidence of an effect. Now, one caveat to this is that all of these studies, come on, 
All of these studies were done um, in um, essentially multi-session multi behavioral support, typically, and relatively few, whether this sort of brief intervention thing. Here's a trial that did so. Um, it wasn't just addressing smoking, but it also addressed smoking. And in this trial, there was, again, no evidence of an effect. It wasn't, strictly speaking, motivational interviewing. It was one of the authors was Steve Rolnick, who invented MI. But he couldn't train doctors to do this within a day, so it was sort of MI light, if you like. But again, no evidence of an effect. Let's go back and see another problem that our doctors are having in these consultations, because if we understand where the problems are, we can get to do something. This is a fairly common consultation in which a couple, I suppose the woman is coming along uh, because she's not getting pregnant and she's come with her partner. And what you can see here is the doctor starts to talk about their smoking. So uh, he says, uh, well, I'll pick it up. So he says, you, you can't be referred to the Stop Smoking Clinic because you're, uh, because you're smoking and it's such a big thing. Uh, if it's going on for a while, you might want to think, try to giving up, he says. Uh, and he goes on, oh, yeah, you need to go to the clinic. And they do these kind of breath tests and stuff like that. He's not Dr. Smooth, is he? Uh, and um, they says that's the main thing generally. OK, but not exercising too much. And you suddenly see this complete shift in topic without ever asking, so do you want to stop smoking? Can I help you stop smoking? Nothing was happening there. In fact, when we looked through these consultations and tried to find out what was happening in this, what you might call offer stage, here's some treatment, why not? We saw all of these issues. We saw doctors were doing it in the conditional sense. But of course, remember, the patient's just been resisting when they've been talking about smoking, the patient's been sort of running away from this kind of conversation. So they do it in a, as if you might want it one day, uh, or they don't personalize it. It's if they or we suggest. It's not me as your doctor suggests. Um, and so on, all through these offers. Essentially just switch, not really making an offer. And that's what's going on in the consultations. OK, one of the things that may strike you as odd if you were to sit through and read all those consultations is what doctors aren't doing is offering medication. And that's sort of weird, right? Because doctoring is about prescribing, amongst other things, but certainly it's about prescribing. And they don't do that. And the reason I think they're not doing it is because doctors don't really know any more about smoking or have different thoughts to the next man on the street. And here's a study of the next man on the street, or woman on the street. Um, uh, and uh, it's, it's a nice qualitative study in which people are trying to talk about why don't you want medication. And uh, they talk about how the mind is so important. They say, oh, it's what is about me and my desire and my really wanting it notion. Uh, and that medicine is a second best choice. And it's as though the doctors are thinking this. The same team went on to do this study. It's a really lovely study in which um, they tried to educate uh, people who smoke about the stuff that you and we all take for granted, that the neuroscience, if you like, of tobacco addiction. And if only people understood that, then maybe, maybe they'd take up treatment. And what this woman is saying is, yeah, I understand now why it's so hard to stop smoking, so it's even more important that I just really want to do it. <laughs> and she's not alone, I just picked out that quote. The authors conclude that what people are doing is they have this underlying belief in the way that we do things, that way that we change our behavior, which is that it's all down to personally wanting to do it, that is explaining why we change. And that in the end, they just incorporate that neuroscience information into that model. It is, in the sense, the absolute delusion of the human mind. What it feels to be like as us is that we make personal choices and that we, you came in here because you wanted to hear the talk, but you came in here because all sorts of social norms about that. And um, 
all of the, we know the science of how behavior is so much automatic and driven and not by choice, but it's not what our mind tells us is true. It's also not what society, uh, many of our societies at least, tell us is true. We live in neoliberal societies with this kind of philosophical, philosophical underpinning about, um, you know, it's all about striving and wanting and achieving. And it's that model of change that drives, is driving people and in the way that they behave when it comes to smoking and smoking cessation. So what can we do about this? Um, well, I want to tell you about some studies that we've done that may give us some of the clues as to what we can do moving forward. This is a brief opportunistic intervention study. It turns out not to be about smoking. It's about weight management. And so we weighed and measured everybody who came to a GP in 137 different general practices across England. And we enrolled the large majority of people who met the criteria for obesity into this study excluding those who were doing something about their weight. Now, um, what happened was we trained the doctors to say something very like that Dr. Smooth consultation, where he said, you know, the best way to lose weight in this case, the best way to lose weight is to go to a weight management service, and that's available free on the NHS. Why not give that a go? That's what we trained them to do. When that was done to just all comers at the end of a consultation, 77% of people said yes. As a result, because more than half of those people who said yes actually went, there was a difference in weight at one year. Now, what's important here is what we did next with those consultations. It's just, we analyzed them using that conversation analysis technique here. And uh, it was my colleague, Charlotte Albury, who led this work. And uh, her thesis is available, but I suggest, because it's a very long thesis, I suggest you wait for the papers which are coming out. Now, you know when you listen to a radio in a foreign country and you don't understand the language and it's a news bulletin, you can tell from the sound of the words and the tone of the voice that this is a bad news story, right? You can tell it. At the same time, when it gets to the end of the news bulletin and a dog has done something funny, you can tell that this is a good news story, right? That's how you can, you can tell this. And our doctors varied in the style that they did it quite a lot. About a third did it bad news, a third did it what we called neutral news, deadpan, and a third or so did it using that good news style. And what we did was look to see what difference it made how doctors did brief interventions. Here is what the, the so the doctor said, well, the best thing you can do is go to a weight management thing. And uh, when the doctor did it in a good news way, nearly everybody said, yes, I'll go. Yes, I'll go when good news was used. Likewise, the large majority actually went using a good news style. Whereas, if doctors used neutral or bad news styles, then far fewer people went. These were, there's several hundred consultations in this analysis. This is another Charlotte's uh, slides, and here the doctor says, um, what we tried to get them to do was to say, what well, I just said to you, the best thing you can do is, is go to a weight management clinic. Um, and what they typically did was say, those funny people at the university want me to say to you that there's a weight management clinic available. This is what we called the neutral footing. And the doctor here in this consultation, the patient says, would you recommend it? And the doctor says, it's not up to me to recommend, which it definitely was. <laughs> but sometimes they shifted from that neutral footing into a, yeah, I think it could be very positive for you. And that was enough to get turnaround in lots of consultations. Here is the footing shifts, as you see here remaining neutral versus footing shifts, and again, you see a big effect on agreement and attendance. So that technique seems to be helpful. I think it could be really good for you. Okay, now, one of the things that, um, I'm gonna go back actually to a consultation. I'll, I'll put this paper up. This is from about 25 years ago. This, well, these consultations were recorded about 25 years ago, and uh, the uh, paper came out a bit later. And um, 
what the doctors are doing here is what doctors think is the best thing to do. Because here are some patients, some of whom have smoking-related illness, even if it's only a cough or a cold, right? They come in, and uh, the doctor says, you know, obviously it's, you're smoking and your cough, kind of, it's related. And what the authors conclude is, let's get rid of it, uh, GPs, although they think that's the best thing to do, that's when you saw explicit resistance. Patients are usually nice to you as a doctor. They always seem grateful, uh, regardless of what they actually think about you. They are nice. Uh, but in these consultations, they saw explicit resistance of patients saying, well, you know, in the, in the case of the title, I'll, get, I'll, I'll, um, I'll stop smoking when you get me better, you know? Sort of aggressive, so almost. And we saw exactly the same in the consultations uh, about weight management, where the doctors tried to link what the patient's health conditions were to their, um, to their weight, that's when we saw explicit resistance. So it's a clear training target that we should stop advising doctors to do this and instead advise them against it. Okay. I've shown you lots of, I suppose, retrospectively analyzed data. Uh, and I want to now briefly turn to talk about a current trial that uh, we're doing. Now, um, it's called the MASK trial, and Rachner presented that earlier today, so I'll just tell you about it briefly. This is a trial in which we try to enroll people who, in some ways, don't know they're being enrolled in a trial. Right? So they, they, they smoke, and uh, we call them in, and we tell them, in broad terms about what's going on. And then they, and they are people with smoking-related illness or serious mental illness. That's who is in, enrolled here. And the reason that those groups are there is because that is the group that doctors have to do, or doctors or nurses have to do, an annual review of that person's health, including addressing their smoking. And of course, what happens, when you've, got, you've got heart disease, and you've not stopped smoking, and then you go every year to see the doctor, and the doctor says, oh, you ought to stop smoking, mate, and go, oh, not really, thanks. And so you kind of lock, you know, the doctor knows that you don't really want to stop, and you, you know, so you've got this sort of collusion thing going on. So it's that context that we're talking about here. And uh, what we did was develop a brief intervention by, for the doctor or the nurse who was seeing the patient for their review, which was using those principles that I've talked about so far in the way that we structure and design consultations uh, and um, uh, uh, trying to get them patients, in this case, to who say, no, I don't want help to stop smoking, to walk away with an e-cigarette to help reduce their smoking, or as we call it, switching. So there's 320 people enrolled. And here's the sort of, um, you know, you can see some of the things I told you, the I think, the what we think is a good question, the would you be willing to give that a go? And in a group who have just 30 seconds before said, no, I don't want help to stop smoking, using these methods, nine out of 10 walked away with an e-cigarette to help them reduce their smoking or switch. Um, the results are sort of still coming in, but roughly speaking, three times as many have made a, a substantial reduction, and three times as many have stopped smoking, albeit um, the latter is not quite significant, or not significant. Ratchner is the uh, lead author on this. Right, let's just quickly finish. Um, the British system, as it were, I think probably came from this sort of evidence, which is a review of all those brief intervention trials that I showed you before, in which we looked at what doctors could do uh, that would increase um, attempts to quit, because after all, that's the sort of first thing a doctor's are trying to do in those brief interventions. And what we found was that when doctors offered support, more people tried it, offering an opportunity creates motivation. You don't need to wait for motivation to come. You need to create opportunities, and motivation will follow. In our trial of brief interventions for weight management, we, um, one of the things that we did 
was when the person said, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll go to the weight management clinic doc, then uh, the, the doctor said, that's fantastic, take this outside, take this form outside, and give it to the person who saw you first, and they'll sort you out with the clinic uh, right now. And so people left the surgery, as we call it, left the office with a, uh, a, a sort of specified appointment. And I kind of knew that was important, but I, I didn't know it, know it. I just felt it in my water, so to say. And um, of course, like all good scientists, I've been on the lookout for evidence to prove that I was right all along. <laughs> and here it is. This is a lovely trial. Uh, it's a US-based trial, but uh, nearly 3,000 people in the trial, brief interventions, and they were randomized to do what our friend Dr. Smooth did, which was say, oh, that's fantastic, you want to stop smoking, here's a, here's a, here's a card, give the quit line a ring, versus I'll get the quit line to ring you. And what you see here is that there was a 20-fold difference in the number of people contacting the quit line in the I'll get them to ring you condition. When it came to enrollment in a behavioral support program, Slightly fewer people who were contacted by the clinic did so, but most of them did. And 14 times as many people enrolled in a behavioral support program. Note the effect size here, 14 times because of this simple action of taking the onus off the person. As clinicians, as often as uh, health behavior specialists, we often feel that um, uh, a person will not be motivated enough to quit smoking if he or she is, can't even be bothered to pick up the phone and ring the clinic. But the lesson of behavioral science is the reverse. This is uh, a study which shows this. It's, that's two reports from this single study. And if you put those together, what you see is this. You see that people who were uh, randomized to phone up themselves were far less likely to do so and start counseling, and nobody completed the counseling course, whereas in the proactive condition, a fair number of people did. But most importantly of all, four times as many people stopped smoking in this ambivalent population. So it's clearly a very important, simple, and successful technique. So, that brings me to the end. I've tried to sketch out a, what I think is a big knotty problem, which is that the culture of medicine puts smoking cessation and prevention outside of our remit. And uh, that's a tricky thing to, for us to address. Um, and, um, but nonetheless, the fact that we can perhaps recognize that allows us as physicians to kind of call out that culture of medicine and think, well, where did that come from? Because it's not really consonant with many of our values. Um, I draw your attention to this study. It's a very nice, more thoughtful, qualitative study. Um, and um, what they did here was they sort of looked at why some doctors felt some kind of commitment. And it was the kind of, these were in general practice, so it was the kind of GPs who felt that their job was beyond simply sitting there and seeing people who were ill and felt some sense of responsibility for their community. Those are the ones that engaged with preventative efforts. Um, and uh, they also saw themselves as part of a cog in a big machine so that smoking cessation, for example, was not their responsibility directly, but they were part of that system. Um, I've also talked about some of the consultation skills and where things are going wrong and what we can do about it. Uh, and I think there are some clear lessons. I'd sort of blame, I could blame national guidance about the ways that we do brief interventions of pushing us to do the wrong thing. But truth is that I don't think doctors really read those national guidelines. So um, it probably makes little difference. But it does make a difference in went so far as we come to act in our system. We need to push people towards the key consultation difficulties and the strategies that we can develop that will overcome those consultation difficulties. And if we do that, I hope that we can make a bigger impact on scaling up uh, treatment. Thank you very much for your attention.
minutes for questions. So if you have a question, please come to the microphone. Hi. Can I start? Yes. Uh, Richard Edwards, University of Otago, Wellington in New Zealand. Uh, thank you very much, Paul. That was a brilliant talk. really enjoyed that. I, I just wondered if, um, if the GP thing, the doctor thing, and I'm a, trained as a doctor as, as well, so I recognize a lot of the things you said, is just a little bit in the too hard basket for, and whether we should actually be focusing more on allied health professionals who might see smoking cessation and giving advice and support as higher up their hierarchy of what they should be doing, whether that's nursing staff or, or, or other um, people, and you know, whether that's the place to put focus and to engineer systems where that, uh, that is built in, rather than focusing so much on doctors. Yeah, good point. Um, for example, uh, if you look at, um, we've done it in the case of obesity, if you look at what nurses think compared with what doctors think, nurses see their role very much more as kind of talking with people, and uh, that sort of element of caring is sort of the essence of what nursing is, for example, whereas sort of talking with people is not really the essence of what doctoring is or the way that doctors think and feel about it. So um, it would be a great strategy. That I suppose one of the issues there is, at least in Britain, the kind of people that go see nurses, is that they don't see them as a sort of, you know, you don't go in with opportunistically, as it were. You're going in for chronic disease care, maybe a cervical smear um, or, um, you know, dressings on ulcers. Um, slightly over-characterizing it, but that's sort of the essence of it. So you don't get that sort of general population going through. So while I agree with you that we should um, certainly help our nurses and help them to do better with their brief interventions, I think uh, our doctors could, could also be pushed a little. Who's? Hi, I'm Shadi Navi. Ah. <laughs> Albert Einstein College of Medicine in Bronx, New York. I appreciate your comments on, you know, I, ju I know I just need to do this, it's all in the mind. And clinically, I've been talking about the predatory marketing of the tobacco industry and the design of cigarettes. Um, what is, you know, and the racism and other targeting that they've done. Um, what is your thoughts on leveraging that sort of messaging? Yeah, I think we have to, I mean, l like you, I put up the Kylie Moffat study um, where they, they tried out a messaging about, in this case, neurobiology, which kind of didn't work. It didn't really change the situation. I think trying those things out, you can obviously try them out if you're a clinician informally with your patients, but um, you could try them out sort of in a sort of more focus group setting and see how those messages are resonating and kind of improve and iteratively get towards uh, helpful ways of talking about a thing that might actually engage people with, with treatment. So yeah, I think that's a great idea. Um, Linda Ferry from Loma Linda University in Southern California, hello. Um, you mentioned ask, advise, refer to a specialty treatment centers, and years ago, I don't remember how many years ago, England was one of the prime examples of setting up tobacco treatment centers in, in regions, and primary care doctors did not need to have the skills to prescribe medicine and treat patients because they weren't trained it in medical school, and the medications were new since they graduated from medical school. And now we have learned that those tobacco treatment centers are not being funded in the same way. Could you make a comment about referring to centers which now either there are less of them or less staff there, um, and what that does in putting the responsibility back on the primary care doctor, because many healthcare systems in the US and around the world do put the onus on the primary care doctor and don't emphasize smoking cessation specialty clinics for people who find it difficult to quit with yeah. this brief intervention. So um, the large majority of people in Britain, as the service evolved, it started off with a sort of uh, group-based model. It quickly evolved into um, practice-based cessation treatment where nurses were trained to give behavioral support and they were, as it were, supervised. Um, to use a counselling term, by the Stop Smoking Service. 
Um, the evidence that we have from evaluations of that is that those services were far less effective at seeming to help people. Um, but sure, uh, what, <laughs> some, some, there are some sort of weird things happening in Britain uh, as uh, austerity, we've had a policy of austerity as bitten. So for example, in my area where I, I work as an academic, they, um, people, doctors are now allowed to prescribe medication. It's only to people who are using a stop smoking service. So we are, we are sort of, you know, rowing back from the position that we were in before. And uh, uh, yeah, I, but I think there is some evidence, for example, that prescribing medic, well, there is clear evidence actually that prescribing medication per se, even without support, is a helpful approach. So. I think it's something that clinicians could do around the world, but you know whether they do, I don't know. Excellent. We have a question here. Uh, hello. Thank you for the talk. Uh, my name is Stephen Binns, research scientist, NORC at the University of Chicago. Uh, my early career was in social work, in suicide intervention, and throughout the entire talk, I couldn't help but imagine many parallels uh, between that work um, and this. And you also cited the example with weight loss. Um, and uh, the question is, you know, earlier in, in the um, presentation, you had that list of diseases by prestige. And I, it went by quickly, but I imagine many at the bottom were mental health um, yep. related. So uh, I'm just wondering uh, how much kind of work has already been done to take these findings and expand them, you know, beyond uh, tobacco control. Um, none that I'm aware of. I mean, I don't think uh, I've, I've, I mean, I, I, I suppose I wouldn't know necessarily, but I've not come across a study that sort of kind of challenged us doctors about the kind of ways and the value judgments that are lying behind that prestige hierarchy, which we all recognize. Um, but yeah, it, it, I think it is something that, that we perhaps need to do, and certainly something that we kind of would be one of the narratives that we might want to weave in if we're trying to train doctors to do this. It's not simply about understanding what to do, it's about sort of winning our hearts about that we should do it and that it is a proper and right thing for a doctor to be doing and not a, not a sort of optional extra that we never get round to. And it is, it's also very challenging and very rewarding. So, uh, you know, it, it, is a, it takes a lot of skill and, and nuance and everything to do it. So. Yeah. Well, hopefully we'll see that. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Final question here. Hi, Paul. Deborah Arnott from Ash. Um, I remember Nice did a review. The first tobacco review they did was about brief, brief advice. Yeah. And if I remember correctly, this goes back to the question about allied healthcare professionals. Um, it was shown to be significantly effective for doctors to do brief advice, but not for nurses or dentists or other healthcare professionals. So I just wondered. Um, if you had any thoughts about that. Yeah, um, my understanding is there's far less, well, there is far less evidence uh, available for those other groups, and therefore absence of evidence isn't evidence of absence. Um, the other thing is it depends on the context. So uh, there's probably simply advising people to stop smoking, which has been what a lot of the studies have done in the past, um, in the context where you're seeing, let's say, people who've got established smoking-related disease is probably an unhelpful thing because if they could stop, they would have. It's not that they don't know that smoking is bad for them. So I think, um, I think that it's plausible that there's some contextual factors in, in, in the way that what the nurses work that are meaning that they're not as effective because they're not seeing people at a sort of opportune time. Please join me in thanking Paul for an amazing talk. We are on to poster session now, and then we'll be back at 1 o'clock for the policy plenary. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Very Thank you. Much. That's a pleasure. Now. <laughs> Great presentation. crazy.